Good afternoon and welcome to NTIA's series on Internet for All. Uh, for today's program, we're going to go into more depth on the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. My name is Laura Spinning and I'm going to be your moderator today. For the agenda, we're first going to hear from my boss and uh, NTIA Associate Administrator Doug Kenkoff. And then we'll have some uh, brief remarks uh, hearing from Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo. And then finally, Evan Feynman, who joined NTIA earlier this year to lead the BEAD program, will talk to us um, in more depth about the program and address issues that are important if you're applying for funding for the program. Finally, we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A in which my colleagues from NIST will join us um, uh, to answer some of your questions if you're planning to apply. And with that, over to you, Doug. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Doug Kinkoff, and I'm the Associate Administrator of NTIA's Office of Internet Connectivity and Growth. Thank you for joining us to learn more about the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, or BEAD as it's known, uh, and the process in support of the Internet for All initiative. As the eligible entities of the $42.5 billion BEAD programs, the states and territories on the webinar today will play a significant role in bringing affordable, reliable, high-speed internet to every community across America. You all will lead the change in working with critical stakeholders within your state or territory, local governments, telecoms, tribal governments, community anchor institutions, community organizations and individuals to build infrastructure where it is needed and to help increase adoption of high-speed internet. We thank those of you that have already submitted a letter of intent to participate in the BEAT program. For those of you who haven't yet, we encourage you to log into our new NTIA grants portal to file those letters of intent as soon as possible. Each state and territory will have dedicated direct support from NTIA staff uh, to walk you through each step of the process. We look forward to continuing to build strong partnerships with each of you to bridge the country's digital divide. I will now pass it over to the 40th Secretary of Commerce, Gina M. Raimondo. Thank you. Hi, I'm the Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo. Thank you for joining us to learn more about our newly launched Internet for All. Fast Internet access is vital for everyday life, but unfortunately that access isn't always available or affordable. More than 30 million Americans lack access to reliable internet, and the problem is much worse in minority and rural communities. Gaps in access mean gaps in opportunity, but help is on the way. President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law includes nearly $43 billion to, in grants to states and territories to achieve the goal of universal high-speed internet. Every state will receive at least $100 million for broadband expansion, equity, and affordability. As a former governor, I know the crucial role that states play in deploying infrastructure. And for this effort to succeed, we need everyone to be at the table. You're on the front lines of the fight to close the digital divide, so we need to hear from you and support you so that you get the resources you need. Thank you for being among the first to step up. Your work will give Americans more power over their own lives, the ability to work where they choose, to study how they want, and to live in the places they love. And it will spur innovation and drive a marketplace with lower costs for higher speeds. I'm so excited about the opportunity ahead of us. If we work hard and work together, we are going to close the digital divide for good and strengthen our communities to ensure America's competitiveness in the 21st century. Thank you so much, Doug and Secretary Raimondo uh, for joining us today and offering those remarks. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit more in detail about the way the BEAD program is going to operate. So let's dive right in. Um, today, what we're gonna talk about is first, the, uh, you're hearing the introduction right now. I hope it's everything you hoped and dreamed. 
Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about the application process. That's going to be really important. Uh, and that's what's in front of you as viewers of the webinar right now. Then we'll talk a little bit about what eligible entities and their subgrantees are going to owe us. Uh, today's webinar is going to focus on BEAD. This is the largest of the four high-speed internet programs that are administered by NTIA. So remember, in addition to DEED, to BEAD, NTIA is also overseeing the digital equity program, the tribal program, which has been in operation but was plussed up in terms of resources, uh, as well as the middle mile program. The BEAD program is going to provide 42, right around $42.5 billion uh, to affect to build uh, infrastructure. And then should infrastructure be built, uh, to support digital equity access and, uh, and uh, community anchor institution connectivity. Uh, this program is designed to get every single American online uh, by funding partnerships between states and territories uh, and, the, and communities, as well as stakeholders, to make sure that infrastructure goes everywhere it's supposed to go. If you look at the timeline down on the bottom, uh, you can see that is a general timeline. Everybody's uh, clocks begin at different moments, depending on when they get their necessary materials in and when funding arrives at, to them. But in general, you should be thinking about getting your letter of intent in, doing your five-year plan within 270 days of getting your planning funds, beginning your new pro your initial pro proposal uh, within 180 days of the FCC maps dropping and our allocation being released, uh, and then your final uh, proposal a year after your initial proposal comes in. So moving forward, we want to be very clear that the BEAD program is closely linked to the Digital Equity Act. Uh, we're not kidding about this. Uh, digital equity lives throughout all of uh, NTIA's programming. And uh, we want to be uh, really clear that ultimately your BEAD plans should fully incorporate all of your broadband activity, but especially we want to make sure that your state digital equity plans uh, are incorporated into your initial and final proposals. Uh, this is really, really, really critical to making sure that your uh, initial and final proposals are a holistic look at the work that you're doing all the way across your state uh, on all issues related to high-speed internet. So moving forward, the BEAD program helps to deliver uh, broadband access and affordability. We wanna be clear that the first priority of this program is increased access for unserved and underserved households. Um, this is gonna be the primary uh, area of spend for the BEAD program. And additionally, the biggest and first task for uh, states and territories as they begin to figure out how they're gonna address connectivity in their, uh, within their borders and how they're gonna approach the BEAD program. We also wanna be very clear that states and territories are gonna have the opportunity to make some decisions about what affordable service looks like for you. We didn't wanna dictate that out of, out of uh, Washington, DC. Rather, we wanted to make sure that we recognize that affordability can mean different things in different places. Um, further, we wanna make sure that those affordability solutions are gonna be uh, solutions that are gonna last. So we don't wanna partially fund something that's not gonna last long-term. We don't wanna do something that's gonna to lead to a cliff in the future. Rather, we wanna build, build sustainable processes so that we can make sure that people have affordable access to high-speed internet, not just today, but into the future. Funding is allocated on a, a minimum allocation with additional funding based on high cost and unserved locations. So what does that mean? Uh, the FCC is gonna put out their new broadband data maps, and uh, those are gonna be an attempt by the FCC to capture every single location of the United States. That's a tremendous undertaking. And so first, we should applaud that. Previous mapping efforts were not as strong as they could have been. They were based on census blocks rather than locations. This new undertaking is, is, a, is a tremendous lift by FCC. They are the first ones to say they're not going to get that perfectly correct uh, right out of the gate, but they're going to try as well as they can, and we're going to have a challenge process to improve those maps. Uh, every single state or territory has a minimum allocation that they're going to get. It's $100 million for every single state, D.C. and Puerto Rico. The remaining territory allocations are a minimum of 25 million. Um, there are also going to be a set aside uh, number of locations that are going to be high cost uh, uh, locations, and they will be served uh, out of a 10% a set aside of the total funds. Uh, and then finally, the, the additional funds will be allocated based on the number of unserved locations in each state uh, as a result of the FCC data maps. That all leads to how we're going to get the top line level of funding that each state has. Then what are you going to do with that money? Well, um, first and foremost, BEAD prioritizes the complete coverage of unserved locations. And there's a couple of important points here. One that's called out in the 
uh, parentheses there. That includes making sure that there's wireless signals or internal wiring, but, but by and large, the best solution is going to be wireless uh, to multifamily units. So simple, simply service to an apartment building doesn't get the job done. We've got to make sure that every unit in that building has the opportunity to make, sir, to, to make a connection. Those unserved locations are anywhere that's got 25.3 or worse. Then we need to make sure that there's infrastructure adequate to get underserved locations online. Uh, those are any locations between 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload and 100 megabits per second download and 20 megabits per second upload. So you think about that category of folks as being in the underserved locations. After that, we got to make sure that every single community anchor institution in the state or territory has at least a gigabit symmetrical uh, service. And then after that, you can use any remaining funds uh, for uh, digital equity, digital literacy or other uh, priorities that the state may have. So we also want to be clear that you don't, you're not alone here. Uh, so look, moving forward, uh, federal program officers, what we're calling our state broadband leaders, are going to be the, the primary points of contact for eligible entities during the application and implementation process. Uh, I, I wish we had all these folks on the staff right now. We unfortunately do not. Um, it, is a, it is a challenge to identify the uh, really talented folks all over the country, uh, interview them and get them on board. We're hiring as fast as we can. Uh, I'm hiring uh, folks every single week and have been for weeks and weeks. Uh, we should by midsummer have about uh, half the team online uh, and then we'll have everybody by the fall. Uh, in the interim, every state should have, if you haven't asked, please ask. You've got an interim point of contact at NTIA. Uh, that you will have until we are able to introduce you to your, uh, your federal program officer in your state. Um, so for now, eligible entities can submit their any questions that they've got to their interim point of contact. Once you've got a federal program officer, you will be able to uh, work through them. Um, you should always make sure that you uh, are working hand in glove with whomever your FPO is. Those folks are ultimately going to be your partners your friends, your consultants, your cheerleaders, uh, all the way through this process, the, uh, they should be your first point of contact and they should have complete visibility into what it is that you're doing. Um, that's gonna make sure that there are no mysteries. Uh, I don't want any state or territory to uh, have any open questions when they submit anything to NTIA. We should know well prior to y'all uh, getting into the system and hitting final submit uh, how things are going to go, where there are open questions, where there aren't, uh, and, and the way your uh, application at each stage of the game will be received. So moving forward, let's talk a little bit about the eligible entity application process. Um, right, off of the, uh, right off the bat, uh, let's be clear about who an eligible entity is. We've gotten an awful lot of folks who emailed us since we rolled the program out saying, hi, you know, I'm uh, Jim Weaver and I live on 123 Elm Street and I'd really like some of that internet. Uh, to, to be clear, uh, eligible entities who apply for BEAD are one of the 50 United States states, DC, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands. Um, you got to be a state or territory to be an eligible entity to submit under BEAD. Then there are sub-grantees. And so for ISPs, uh, localities that may run municipal service, um, folks who are interested in doing middle mile work, uh, folks who are interested in running digital equity programming, you are what we're characterizing as sub-grantees. So you are entities that could receive grant funds from an eligible entity. So you, you, they're the grantees are the eligible entities, and then sub-grantees are the folks who get money through the eligible entities uh, programs that they set up and, de and define for us in their initial plan. So looking at the timeline, this is a more detailed version of what you saw on the slide above. We'll cruise through it really quickly. Get us your letter of intent by uh, July 18th. Uh, you can request up to $5 million in initial planning funds. I don't know why you would request less than $5 million, but request whatever you think you need. Uh, then submit a, a five-year action plan relatively shortly thereafter, 270 days thereafter. Um, that helps us uh, know what the, those are, that's the broad strokes of what it is you're planning to do. So you should have uh, you know, at least the skeleton of what your initial proposal is gonna be over the course of those 270 days. Then you get your initial proposal to us uh, half a year after your uh, allocation comes out. Uh, then you know we will review that. We'll at, we'll approve at least twenty percent of your allocation so that you can get moving with your programs. Uh, and then uh, you'll get us your final proposal uh, a year after that, and we'll release the remainder of the funds. So moving on to the application process. Uh, 
As we've said, you've got to get us your letter of intent. A bunch of you already have. I believe as of this morning, more than 20 states had. That's really exciting. Um, please keep them rolling in. There's absolutely no reason not to do this. This is a light lift, guys. Uh, your letter of intent includes a statement that, and we, we have a sample of a template that you can use, but uh, a statement that, that you plan to participate in the program, you identify how the program's going to work, at least, you know, who the point of contact is within uh, your state or territory, and you request your planning funds. You'll also need to submit an application for those planning funds, uh, which has a, a, a pretty bare bones budget uh, for how you're going to spend it. Again, we tried to make this as easy and approachable as possible. Um, no matter what, um, we've got to get those in before uh, the end of July 18th. So looking at your five-year action plan, um, eligible entities that receive an initial plan, that receive initial planning funds absolutely must submit uh, their five-year action plan to us. Uh, there is a lot that you can do here. As I said, what you want to think about here is uh, what are the early stages of what you're doing and give us a really high level look at first what you're doing um, with those $5 million in planning funds, but second, uh, how you are going to uh, take on this program in a, in a broad sense. So when you think about ways you can spend those initial planning funds, absolutely establishing capacity in uh, your state and territory office. This is really important. Um, if we are not confident that you have a, uh, uh, an office that's ready to allocate tens uh, or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of funds, we're not going to be able to give you the, the money. So you got to make sure you're ready to run that program. But there's also a bunch of other stuff that you're going to be able to do, including uh, research and data collection, development of preliminary budget. Y'all can read, so I'm not going to run through all the rest of that. Uh, but if you uh, look at the next slide, you can see a much more detailed look at uh, the sorts of things we're expecting from you in your five-year action plan. Um, again, I'm not going to run through all these bullets, but a few that I will call out for you. Um, current funding available is going to be really important, as well as details of any existing programs you're already running. Um, we definitely want you to call out those known uh, likely or, pre or existing currently barriers to uh, implementation. We definitely want, to the extent you've got it, to know what your local broadband service needs and gaps are. And then that comprehensive high-level plan. So again, you don't have to have answered all the questions here. We just really want to know the, your best cut at those questions right now uh, and how they will look when you get into the middle of it. Uh, moving on, we will be, uh, as we had with the letter of intent, uh, we're going to be publishing a template. Um, you can use our template, uh, but that's certainly not required. Uh, you can also use uh, existing plans, provided they uh, have been completed within one year of receipt of initial planning funds, and they check all the necessary boxes for our work. You don't have to duplicate efforts if you've already got a plan that's going to work very well. Let's talk a little bit about the initial proposals. Uh, and again, these, this is looking well into the future. So, you know, be aware that this is not something you need to attack right now, but uh, within 180 days of allocations being released after the release of the FCC maps. So here we're talking very late in this calendar year or uh, early in the next calendar year, 2023. Uh, we're going to make sure that uh, once you know how much money that you, once you know how much money you've got, and we're going to get that to you as soon as we can, each eligible entity is going to have 180 days to get us this initial proposal. This is going to be much more detailed than the, uh, than the five-year action plan. This is really the first draft of the final plan that's going to get every single citizen in your state or territory online. Um, you should be uh, including a lot more detail in how you're going to run your subgrantee process in what the, the considerations are that you're using in whether or not you're de deviating from program criteria, uh, you know, recognizing that we've set very broad guardrails. There's a lot of room within our program for states and territories to set their own priorities, but you need to tell us about that uh, as soon as you're able to. Uh, then as soon as you get it into us, uh, we will uh, do a review. You got to make sure that every single political subdivision, as well as tribal entities, have an opportunity to submit um, their own plans for consideration, as well as comment on your plan. So that goes back to a, a really fundamental aspect of this program. Um, we expect you to be collaborating um, in an ongoing basis. So this is not the state or territory office writes a plan and uh, then we put it out, you allow people to submit comment and that's it. No, we expect you to be in an ongoing dialogue with these folks. This is as much about partnership between the state and territory office with local and tribal governments as it is about partnership between the federal office 
the federal government and the local and the state uh, broadband office. Um, finally, we're going to take a look at your initial proposal and uh, we're going to release 20% uh, or more of your total allocation. The next slide goes into some detail about what we expect to see uh, in your initial proposal. Um, we are likely to have a, uh, a template here, uh, but we're, we're still working on how that might look. Uh, different states and territories have a lot of opportunity to uh, go in different directions. And of course, you're facing very different challenges. And so, you know, the plan that uh, New Jersey writes is going to be awfully different from the plan that New Mexico writes. And so the a template might wind up being, you know, adding more heat than light. Uh, so we're still working through that question. But regardless, every initial proposal is going to need to include at least these 19 components. I won't read them all through for you here, but please come back to this slide uh, early and often as you're developing your action plan so that you know what you're shooting for. Um, looking forward just into a little more detail on how you're going to get that initial funding uh, number. Uh, as again, you've got your minimum allocation. So no matter what, you're getting that. Then you're gonna get high cost allocation if you have high cost areas in your state or territory. And that's gonna be what percentage of the total high cost areas nationally do you have times uh, the 10% set aside that we uh, took out off the top. Uh, and then the remaining funds will be allocated based on the percentage of unserved locations that each new area has. Um, looking forward from there, uh, again, uh, we will release uh, at least 20%, you can ask for more and we'll, we'll take a look at that. At least 20% of your total allocation for the purposes that are identified in your initial proposal. Um, the assistant secretary is gonna review that to make sure it is compliant, does what it's supposed to do, uh, is in the public interest and, and pursues the goals of the act. Um, if your proposal is approved, we'll release those funds. Um, you've gotta make sure that uh, both in the, the work that you're doing under your initial proposal and certainly in the work that you're doing under your final proposal, there is a challenge process. And so I wanna be clear that there are two challenge processes in this program. First is the challenge process that you engage with FCC on their maps. The second is a challenge process within uh, your subgrantee selection process. And that's really important to make sure that we are in a granular level, um, serving everywhere that needs to be served and not serving areas that are already served uh, by 100 over 20 service. Um, this is an opportunity to deviate from the FCC maps, which were a snapshot in time, and reflect the real circumstances on the ground in each political subdivision or project area that you're building in. This is really important. I, I want folks to, to spend some time thinking about their challenge process. This is gonna be something that you're gonna discuss a lot uh, with your FPO, because we've gotta make sure that is the way that we make sure that the projects that we're funding are projects that are gonna get us to universal coverage. Um, looking forward, uh, the eligible entity is going to have to conduct a uh, uh, process, you know, this goes into the challenge process that we were just talking about, uh, is going to have to uh, make sure that the challenge process uh, completes before funds come out. And then um, we're going to make sure that uh, after resolving each challenge, uh, the eligible entity is transparent. And, you know, you should be as transparent as you can be throughout this entire thing. The only items of information that you're going to need to um, keep proprietary are going to be a, a set of, of uh, a, some information that's shared with you from ISPs. I, I strongly encourage you to take a look at your FOIA laws right now to make sure that you can have an open and honest dialogue uh, with ISPs about where they are and aren't. Uh, and then finally, to be clear, you know, we have the authority to reverse a, de a determination um, of an eligible entity with respect to a particular location. Um, taking a look at the next slide, uh, eligible entities must use your first 20% of total funds um, for the purposes that you described. Uh, this is in many ways what people would expect, right? You know, if you say to a grant making entity, in this case NTIA, uh, we plan to use our funds to do X, we certainly expect you to do X. Um, you can use your funds for select purposes uh, after the challenge process and subgrantee selection. Um, and we may waive that limitation um, depending on specific special circumstances. And, you know, it says that a lot through here. It also says that a lot in the NOFO. And we want to be clear that we did our best to write a NOFO that uh, reflects um, the breadth of challenges that states and territories are going to run into. But our ability to predict, to predict the future is limited, unfortunately. And uh, if you have it, run into a circumstance where something that is contemplated in the NOFO or in this process doesn't work for you, be open and honest with us. Don't try to fit square pegs into round holes. If there is an opportunity for there to be an exception made, um, we want to talk that through with you. 
uh, taking a look at the next stage, uh, we want to be clear that everything is uh, competitive. So you can't just pick uh, your favorites. You can't just pick the ISP that uh, you know has been the the most helpful so far. Uh, rather, there's got to be a fair, open, and competitive process for selecting subgrantees. There are a wide variety of ways to do this, and we're happy to talk through the different models with you uh, as you develop your subgrantee selection. Excuse me, subgrantee selection process. Uh, but you know, in general, and I'm, we're not going to run through all of these bullets, but uh, we want you to think about the fact that uh, you can serve as small a project area as a single location, as large a project area as many hundreds of square miles. Middle mile infrastructure can be a part of it, but we've got to make sure that um, there is at least one user of that middle mile infrastructure who's going to be a last mile uh, provider. Uh, you can't do something that you are already doing. So these are not funds that you can use to uh, backfill or uh, otherwise substitute for already allocated funds. Um, you've got to make sure that you're maximizing the match. So we, we need to be clear about that. The 20% match that is contemplated uh, by this program, that is the minimum match. There are a ton of locations in this country that are currently unserved or underserved that are economically efficient for a private sector ISP to serve with far less than an 80% subsidy from the government. And so you should be making sure that you're right-sizing your subsidy to the necessary subsidy for uh, a given um, for a given location on the map. Uh, there are a bunch of other uh, points here that we can run through, but you know those are the highlights. Uh, looking forward at prioritization, uh, eligible entities must serve all unserved locations first. So that's that tw uh, under 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload. And again, that includes locations in multi-tenant buildings. Then you must serve uh, uh, eligible entities, must serve underserved locations. That's anybody under 100 over 20. Then you got to do community anchor institutions. Then you can do all the rest of the great digital equity programs that we're talking about. And I want to be clear that when I'm saying then, I mean by way of prioritization, not temporally. So you can have a plan that attacks all three of these uh, priorities or all four of these priority areas all at the same time. We just have to be confident that no matter what, the you know there's going to be uh, adequate resource if we're spending a single dollar in category four, you know, all of your digital equity programming, the categories one through three are definitely adequately resourced to get the job done. Um, moving forward from there, um, when selecting among proposals, eligible uh, entities must use the approved process, right? That's again, that goes back to, uh, look, you said you were going to do in your initial proposal uh, X, you need to do X. If something changes, be clear with us right away. And again, you know, when you think about your priority broadband projects, uh, this is, uh, you're going to need to select a priority broadband project versus a non-priority broadband project during your selection criteria. Um, if there's more than one priority broadband project, and these, this question of what's a priority broadband project uh, is defined in detail in the NOFO, but in general, they're projects that are going to be fiber to the home or fiber to the premises projects. Um, that is the strongest technology available right now. It's, it's as future-proof as any ISP's uh, delivery method is, and it's the one that is the priority approach. Um, that doesn't mean that we're only going to build fiber. It doesn't mean that you should only build fiber. It simply means that should be the first option and the selected option if you're choosing. Um, if you've got multiple opportunities to choose, then you're going to want to look at what's the least cost, what's the affordability uh, offerings within that project, uh, are they using fair labor practices, and then how fast can they get out there, workforce deployment, open access, local and tribal coordination. Um, if there's uh, only one project, uh, for a given area, that's the default winner, unless you don't want to, unless you don't think it's a strong project, or we don't think it's a strong project, in which case, uh, you know, we can have a talk about that and we can figure out how to rerun the process to get better entities in there. Um, again, if there's more than one proposal, you want to use those same, uh, you want to use the same criteria to determine which one uh, is the winner. Looking forward, um, eligible entities must identify a high cost per location threshold. Um, that is going to be the extremely high cost for uh, location threshold. This is effectively the break point um, at which you're going to stop deploying fiber out into the world and start switching to more affordable delivery mechanisms. There are a lot of different ways to take this on, and ultimately you're going to need to figure out what the approach is that's right for your state or territory. We Again, we want to be clear that uh, this is not a prescriptive approach. There is not a cookie cutter, uh, you know, density level or cost per location um, that makes sense nationally. Rather, we're going to work with you to make sure that the 
that decision point about where the extremely high cost per location is, uh, is something that makes sense given the amount of funds that each state or territory has, the challenge that's in front of them, and the, the distribution of the unserved locations within their state or territory. So looking forward, um, subgrantees are going to have to meet some, uh, some qualifications so that they're going to be eligible. Um, the seven specific criterion are financial capability, you know, can this entity, uh, can we trust this entity with this amount of money, managerial capability, can we trust this, this entity with their ability to do this uh, and, and make sure that, you know, the folks involved running it are going to do a good job, technical capacity, um, that is what this uh, entity puts forward, something that's going to actually work, um, compliance with the laws, right? We should, let's just set that as a, as a floor for everything we're doing. Let's try to follow the laws as often as possible. Um, operational capacity, you know, do we know that these folks have done this before? Um, we need to know who, who the ownership is. Uh, and then is there any other, you know, to what extent are they publicly funded already? Looking forward from there, um, let's talk about match. Uh, matching funds should be at least 25% of project costs. And again, I wanna, I wanna stress that at least. If every project that we fund is, uh, only 25% matched, uh, you're not going to have enough money in a bunch of states. You need to make sure that you're not providing windfalls, that rather we are right-sizing those uh, match percentages to uh, the, the project that's in front of you. The best way to do that is to have an open uh, conversation with the applicant about what their costs are and what their revenues are going to be. Uh, but there are a lot of different other programmatic ways you can make sure that happens. Um, this is, you know, this is not going to be true everywhere. Everything is different, but, you know, in Virginia, what we saw was that uh, our, in the aggregate, our matches were above 50% uh, across all of the projects that we, that we brought in. Um, again, we're going to have a preference for minimum subsidy. So the folks who are asking for the least money are going to be, uh, should be the strongest applicants. Uh, I also want to be really clear though, that that can't happen on the backs of laborers. So we are not going to be doing rewarding people for underpaying or taking advantage either of their direct staff or of uh, subcontractor staff. So you do have to make sure that you've got very strong labor practices throughout uh, all of the projects that you're funding, because we want to make sure that in addition to building great networks, that we're creating great jobs. Um, the rest of this slide you can read through, but you know the highlights are, you know, a certain set of funds can be used uh, that are federal funds can be used as match. That's unusual. Additionally, matching funds can be cash or in kind, uh, according to the uniform administrative requirements. Uh, and then we can grant waivers to uh, match requirements uh, if you persuade us to. Uh, your final proposal, we're a long way out from this, guys, but you know, we're just going to talk about it in general really quickly. Um, you got to get this 12 months after uh, your initial proposal is improved. Um, the NOFO describes some minimum requirements for the final proposal, and we're going to provide a template for this no matter what. Um, prior to submission, every single uh, political subdivision and native uh, or tribal entity has to have the opportunity to submit a plan for consideration, just as before. Um, and uh, when this is approved, you'll get the, any remaining funds that you uh, didn't get dispersed as a result of your initial proposal. Uh, the next slide shows 15 components that you have to have in your final proposal. Uh, moving on from there, uh, the final proposal implementation uh, status of plans detailed in the initial proposal. Look, guys. Uh, we need to know what you're doing to streamline your processes. Uh, this is about your own state code, your own state regulatory process, and your own state uh, uh, standard operating procedures, especially, you know, think about rail and highway crossings, think about pole access, think about rights of way, think about conduits. Uh, we also want to talk about your labor and workforce activities, not just what your labor standards are, but how are you making sure that uh, the industry is going to have the workers that they need to make sure this is happening. Um, what are you doing to make sure that we're opening the door to competition from minority businesses, uh, small women-owned businesses, uh, and what, you know, what are the labor surplus of the area firms? Make sure that we've got a low-cost plan and make sure that you're taking into account climate change and resiliency. And that's important. You know, we don't want to build stuff in uh, floodplains or areas that are going to be subject to a significantly increased storm activity. Or if we are, we want to make sure that we've got a plan and we've taken a look at, uh, well, gosh, you know, what's it cost to harden them versus replace them? What's the approach that we're going to take to thawing permafrost in Alaska? Uh, you know, those are things that we want to see you grapple with so that we can be very clear that uh, what you're doing is going to, these investments are going to last and that we're wisely contemplating the future of how these things are going to be uh, interacting with the natural war, world. Uh, taking a look at the next slide, 
the final pro proposal is going to be the disbursement of your remaining uh, funds. That'll be at least, you know, that'll be as much as 80%, depending on how much was dispersed with your initial proposal. Um, example uses of funds here, this is what you think it is. This is deployment projects in un and underserved locations. This is your connecting your community anchor institutions. This is you running your uh, digital equity work. Um, looking on from there, uh, we want to take a look at just a couple of examples of uh, the ways you can use it, right? Again, infrastructure on the left, non-infrastructure on the right. Um, all of these are eligible uses that we put down here. These are far from the only possible uses of funds. Uh, we just lay these out as examples for you to take away. And, you know, we're, we're, uh, uh, we're very interested in hearing other ideas. You know, we do not have a monopoly on good ideas at NTIA. Um, we're very excited to engage with all of the talent that exists in the state offices uh, as we move through this process. So uh, moving forward to implementation and monitoring, um, both eligible entities and subgrantees are going to have to comply with um, robust reporting requirements. We've tried to right-size these to make sure that we're getting all the information in that we need but are not being overly burdensome. Um, everybody's going to have a different uh, decision point on where exactly that line is. Uh, we've done our best here, guys. Uh, the initial reports due within 90 days of receiving any grant funds. Um, we need a semi-annual report no later than uh, one year after receiving grant funds, then semi-annually. And then we need a final report no later than one year after all the grant funds are expended. Um, Subgrantees are also going to have uh, reporting requirements, and we can go through those bullets. But you know, you got to tell us where you're building. You got to tell us what you're doing. You got to tell us what the actual quality of service is uh, in those areas if it's infrastructure, or you've got to tell us the other agreed upon uh, metrics if it's a non-infrastructure program. Um, looking more deeply into uh, eligible entity and subgrantee obligations, uh, you know your obligations here as an eligible entity. Uh, you've got to consider all provider types. You've got to ensure subgrantee accountability. You've got to do local coordination. You got to make sure that you're equitable and non-discriminatory. You got to do your fair labor practices. You got to have a workforce that's adequate to do this. You got to make sure that you're non-discriminatory. You got to make sure you're taking into account climate resiliency. That's uh, eight really big points. Um, every single one of those is something that we're going to take very seriously. There are no blow-off parts to this program. You need to have engaged in a real way with each of those eight uh, requirements. Looking forward as well. Um, the eligible entities uh, are going to need to really engage. You know, I, I said this before, and I'll, I'll say it again. This slide exists to highlight this. Um, we expect ongoing coordination with local governments. This is not about, hey guys, this is what we're doing. Instead, this is about a partnership between the state and territory office and local governments. You need to be engaged with those folks throughout. And they need to have confidence, each and every one of them, that the projects that are going on in their borders, you know, within this county, within that city, are going to be projects that are going to be uh, projects that are going to accomplish the program's goals. So a county board should have confidence that the project going on in their county is going to get every resident in that county online. Um, you know, we're going to be directly engaged with your local governments and, and tribal entities as well. And we're going to hear if they're not happy with the level of coordination that's happening. Uh, looking forward from there, uh, fair labor practices and a highly skilled workforce, this is really important. Um, as we said before, um, you got to give us uh, assurances that while you're driving the best bargain you can, that bargain does not include uh, taking advantage of workers. Uh, and in fact, we want to see you giving preferential weight to projects based on the strength of their uh, fair labor practices. Similarly, we want to make sure that y'all are investing in you know, a really strong workforce that's going to be able to not just build these projects, but maintain them over time. That is one of the many ways in which this program creates a bunch of jobs, not just during the construction phase, uh, but moving forward. Uh, taking a look at the next slide, climate resiliency. Uh, again, we're going we're gonna to have some more detail for you here, but in general, um, you got to figure out where this is going to present problems. You got to talk about what those problems are. You got to show us how you grapple with those problems. Uh, and you got to detail the, the way in which you're going to continue to take that, to, to do that analysis as uh, work moves forward. Um, your uh, past there, your subgrantee op, uh, obligations are, first of all, you got to build the networks we said, we said that you need to build. So at least 100 over 20 or a gigabit uh, symmetrical for community anchor institutions, that latency has got to be slow and you can't have a lot of outages. 
uh, you got to deploy and begin service not later than four years after you get your grant. Um, there's a possible one year extension. We don't want to grant those except in circumstances where we have to, but we also understand that large construction projects are what they are. Um, the supply chain is a problem, workforce is a problem. We're going to be reasonable, but plan on uh, deployment and service not more than four years after your subgrant is received and try to go faster than that. There's no reason when you've got the materials and you've got the crews, you can't build faster than that. Um, there'll be milestones built into all of your contracts. And then we wanna make sure that of course you're offering a low, a low cost plan. We are not subsidizing any uh, provision of service that includes data caps. We gotta make sure that the service is accessible and we gotta make sure that folks know that you're there and you're offering service. You wanna do that to uh, our, uh, our uh, incentives are aligned here. Uh, moving on to the next uh, slide, this goes into a little more detail on the low cost plans. Uh, eligible entities must propose a low cost broadband service option. Um, that's again, that's the state and territories are going to come to us and say, here's what we think a low cost service option is in our uh, state or territory. We've gotten a lot of questions on this already. Guys, if we could have just said, here's what a low cost service plan is everywhere in the country, we would have done that. The reality is one, we can't do that. And two, every state and territory is different. A low cost service plan in uh, in, in a very dense high cost area is going to be different from a low cost service option uh, in an affluent suburb. And so, we, you know, we want to make sure that we're, uh, that we're making, that we're tailoring this program in all of its aspects to the needs of each state and territory. We do give you an example of uh, a low cost plan that we're going to be very favorably inclined to approve. Uh, and again, that's one that hits our benchmark, uh, provides subscribers with at least one low cost plan. Um, has low latency, doesn't have data caps, uh, and is below $30 a month, inclusive of uh, the new affordable connectivity plan subsidy. So taking a look at next steps, uh, if you're a telecom provider, make sure you're in dialogue with your uh, state or territory broadband office so that you can apply to be a BEAT subgrantee uh, when, that is when it is time for you to do that. I want to be clear that no ISP should be expecting to apply directly to NTIA. You don't need to do that. Um, similarly, your subgrantee, your subgrantee process in your state or territory probably doesn't exist yet. Be in dialogue with your uh, state broadband office, but don't expect for there to be an application for you right around the corner. Uh, if you're a tribal government, make sure you're in dialogue uh, with your state broadband office and you're watching for plans to come out, as well as developing uh, your own plans. You should also be talking to our tribal program to make sure that your work under the tribal program marries well with the BEAD program. If you're a community anchor institution and you don't already have gigabit service, go ahead and identify yourself your, yourself to your state broadband office. That's going to be really important. We got to make sure that every one of you uh, gets at least a gigabit symmetrical service. Uh, and you, you want to be engaged. If you think you're a community anchor institution, but you might not, be engaged with your, uh, your state broadband office to make sure that you're included in the definition of a community anchor institution for that state. If you're a local government, this is really important. Uh, if you're a local government and you've got citizens who aren't online, you already know about it. They've been telling you about it for years. Uh, make sure that you are ready to either bring forward a plan yourself or to uh, comment uh, in, in an informed fashion uh, on any plans that the state broadband office develops for your community. You are the last line of defense. If these plans come to us and we hear from you that it's thumbs up, all systems go, we're, gonna, we're highly likely to support that plan. And if it turns out later that that plan left some of the members of your community high and dry, that's a problem for everybody. We're counting on y'all to help us. Uh, we know that's going to be a heavy lift for a lot of local governments, but the fact is you're the closest to the ground. You guys should have, uh, a, you guys should have and do have a critical say in the way this program works in your county, your city, your town, um, but you got to engage with us so we know that it's working. And if you're a community organization or an individual, uh, look, start, if you're a community organization, start planning about if you're doing digital equity work, you know, how you could improve or expand the programmatic work that you're doing um, and be ready to apply for those, uh, for that program. In addition to being ready to apply for it uh, as a subgrantee through the state, uh, take a look at one of our digital equity. We have a mainline digital equity program at, at NTIA. Uh, those deadlines are coming up sooner. Uh, make sure that you are ready to engage with that program as well. Um, next steps on the next slide for uh, uh, applicants related to BEAD. Uh, listen, we need to know who uh, uh, you are and you need to know who we are. So in your letter of intent, you identified your point of contact. Reach out to us so that uh, you know your point of contact with us. That's uh, for most states and territories right now is going to be an interim point of contact until your federal program officers come on board. Uh, and then we will introduce them to you. 
Um, make sure you're doing outreach now. The earlier you start, the better. Um, if you've got any questions, submit them to bead at ntia.gov. Uh, you're already at a webinar, you're doing great. Uh, but you know, attend as many future, future webinars as you can. Make sure you get us that letter of intent by July 18th. Listen, guys, you're not signing this in blood. If you, for some reason, decide that you don't want to engage with the program later, that's fine. But if you don't get us that letter of intent by July 18th, uh, you have closed the door and it would be a, a terrible error. Uh, and then decide whether to request and then how much of the $5 million in planning funds you're going to ask for and uh, get us, that, uh, uh, get us that, that plan for how you're going to spend it. Uh, looking forward, here are your, uh, a couple of uh, inquiry places that you can ask questions. First, me, guys, here I am. I, I want to help you. Uh, you can always reach out to me. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I get a lot of email. It is what it is. But just email beat at ntia.gov, and I will get back to you as soon as I'm possibly able. Um, also, Scott McNichol is great at, at NIST. Uh, they're going to be handling some of the nuts and bolts of the grants for us. And then if you've got any communications or external affairs type questions, uh, reach out to Stephen. Um, super friendly, uh, very happy to help you at press at ntia.gov, and uh, we would all love to talk to you. And with that, uh, we can move on to the next part of the webinar. Thank you very much. All right, so I think we are on for the Q&A. So if I could have our panelists come on, we've got probably more questions than we can answer in the chat box and give me just a minute to pull some of those up because so I have somehow lost them. Um, so Evan, we got a lot of questions about um, who has applied and how somebody might know if their state has submitted their LOI or is applying for the planning funds. So uh, I'll need to figure out, I don't think there's any reason we couldn't release uh, from whom we've gotten a letter of intent. Uh, we'll share that. We're now up, I believe, over 40 as of this morning. Uh, so, you know, folks keep coming in. Uh, the, the key thing here is, uh, you know, we will release soon. I, I do need to check, I suppose, about whether or not there's some reason we couldn't release uh, the list of states that have gotten us a letter of intent, but I, I can't imagine we couldn't. And so we'll, we'll certainly share that as soon as we can. Um, and then following the letter of intent, we do guys, you know, it's not just send the letter, get 5 million. It's send the letter, then send us your very, you know, it's still easy to do as federal grant applications go. But you know, you got to tell us. You got to have a budget. You got to tell. You got to complete that application to tell us what you plan to do with those five million in planning dollars. Right. Thank you. There were also Evan a number of questions around the local coordination. I think a lot of them came in earlier in the discussion because um, I know you talked quite a bit about that in the in the deck. But could you say a little bit more about the requirements around local coordination, both with counties and tribes and localities? Yeah, thank you, Laura. Really happy to do that. Uh, this is not a requirement that we put on for box checking. This is not a requirement uh, that we're doing to make local governments or tribal governments feel good. This is a critical component to getting this right. The simple fact is in the same way, we sitting in DC are not going to be able to do a great job reliably saying this project here, that project there, that project in the third place and ensuring that we're going to get everybody covered, you sitting in your state and territory capital cannot be as confident that a given project will cover every person in a locality as you can be if you're working directly with leaders in that locality and that community. So being in dialogue with tribal leaders, being in dialogue with community leaders, being in dialogue with stakeholders, and vetting your plan consistently past them while you're, while you're at the outline stage, while you've got drafts, while you've got a potential proposal before you send it to us, when you're contemplating sending it to us, when you're thinking about it in the morning, run these things past the community leaders that you're trying to serve, they will make the plan better. And that is the, the core reason we want to do this. It's not about any other kind of, oh, it's nice when people work together. There's a better outcome that comes when everybody's at the table. And in fact, the only way we're going to get this done, the only way we're going to get every single American online, which is a hugely challenging undertaking, is to uh, bring everybody together and have a whole of community approach to solving this giant problem. 
Well, um, you were very emphatic about that during the presentation and here. Um, thank you for clarifying on that question. I I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit because we had two questions about that were specific about contacts for the state of Maryland and for American Samoa. So uh, what I will do is we will note that um, we right now we have interim contacts, guys. So the 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 fact is we've got existing NTIA staff who are along with their other jobs, making sure that uh, responses from uh, individual, uh, responses get to individual states as they are required. And you know those are not gonna be your full-time uh, state broadband leaders. Rather, uh, those are you know, folks who will make sure you get the, the answers you want. And so having successfully filibustered while my <laughs> uh, Excel loaded up, um, uh, Gilbert Resendez, so that's G-R-E-S-E-N-D-E-Z at NTIA.gov is the Maryland point of contact. And which was the other, Laura? American Samoa. American Samoa, who just got off the phone uh, with the, the person who will be our staff person uh, there. Really, really, really impressive guy. Super excited to join us. I'm excited to have him, um, but not on the staff yet. So you will be talking to Yuki Miyamoto, which is and and the email address there is y m i y a m o t o at ntia.gov. Um, and and rather than continue to do this, guys, uh, the, <laughs> if you just shoot us an email at bead at ntia.gov, if you're from any other state, uh, we will we will send you your direct point of contact. And you can right. also just ask questions of of bead at ntia directly. I think that's a good uh, suggestion as a matter of email to send it to the bead email and we'll circulate it to try to get folks um, the answers that they need back. I'm sorry, I should have shouldn't have put you so directly on the spot for that. Okay, but, happy to do it. Um, so there's another question here about clarifying dates. Um, what's the distinction between the 718 date and the 815 date? So one is for the letter and one's for the application. So uh, you recognizing the application is somewhat more difficult than writing a letter. Uh, we, we got a little more time. Uh, but so you got to get us the letter uh, by the July date and then the application by the August date. All right. Um, so I'm not sure I'm going to get this question right the way it was submitted in the chat. But some, um, on subgrantees, are we able to also apply for the $5 million with a state entity if we have a public-private partnership? Public-private partnerships are great. Uh, that's what a lot of this program is gonna be, but no, that $5 million is for uh, uh, the state broadband office to use to ensure its capacity, uh, its, its understanding, its knowledge is there. Now, that's not to say that a state office might not Put out a solicitation for X, Y, or Z sorts of support, uh, but you know that'll be that'll be situational depending on what those state offices do. So what I would say is, do not absent hearing from your state office that they are seeking um, X, Y, or Z sorts of support. Uh, don't expect any opportunity to apply for that five million dollars. Thank you. And of course, um, if they if the person who asked that question was asking something a little bit differently, they should feel free to send an email to bead at ntia.gov. All right, next question. Um, and Evan, I'm sorry, these are all these all seem to be for you. Um, does NTIA determine successful challenges or is that the responsibility of the state? Yes. Um, the <laughs> both is the answer. Uh, the, we expect the states uh, and we will support the states in the development of really good challenge processes uh, related to uh, the um, validation of locations within a proposed project area. Uh, that, that process ought not require NTIA uh, contradiction or uh, oversight beyond that it was administered fairly and in accordance with the rules that were developed. That said, uh, we reserve the right to disagree, and so we do have the opportunity, um, if we disagree with a state determination as regards a location or set of locations, um, to make that edit to what will or will not be, be funded. All right. And all of this, I mean, to dig into the challenge processes a little bit here, and I- Thank you. I really wish, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? And there were a million brilliant people who had uh, pen to paper on this snow foe, uh, but- 
you know, going back, if we could have called the two challenges something other than a challenge process and a challenge process that really I think would have added a little clarity. Uh, the, there's a challenge process related to the FCC maps. And that challenge process is about what is shown as served or unserved on the FCC maps. Those maps will be the, uh, the beginning of the conversation about how much money the state is going to get and where there needs to be infrastructure constructed and where there doesn't. That said, uh, recognizing that even that challenge process will not lead to an indefinitely perfect map, uh, we also require that states, as a part of their subgrantee selection process here, so this is really clear, you're going to define project areas or people will bring you and they say, we want to build here, or you'll say, we are, you know, we in partnership with this county don't want to build here, or we are soliciting bids for this, or we're reverse auctioning this, right, because there's a lot of different models people can take. But what you want to say, when that project area is defined, then there's an opportunity for locations to be both added or subtracted from that project area based on feedback from, you know, one imagines local government saying, hey, you missed these areas, or ISP saying, hey, actually, these locations are in fact covered. And, you know, you take in evidence of that, and then you, you, you take in a digital exacto knife out and you carve out or you add on the areas to the project area uh, that will ensure that we get the universal coverage, right? These networks are not uniformly shaped. One of the really frustrating things is you sort of imagine at the outset of this process that there's going to be, you know, big areas and they're going to have smooth lines and the network ends there. And then there's a big C out here. And that's not the case at all. It's much more, you know, Jackson Pollock paint splatter type stuff. And so what we've got to do is draw project areas that are our best attempt to figure out uh, where the unserved folks are and then talk to both network owners and community members to make sure that we're catching all the people that need access and that we're not overbuilding uh, unnecessarily. Very good. Well, leading um, from that question, I'll tee to another one about mapping and a question about can a county or a locality um, use planning funding uh, to collect data locally to either validate or refute um, what the map says? So there's a couple of things in there. If by planning funding, you mean the $5 million to your state, or territory, uh, probably not, right? Unless that's a use that the state or territory office has prioritized and then they might distribute it out. They might not, I, you know, that'll vary state and state by territory to territory. Uh, you certainly can and should try to get a good handle on, in general, where service is in your community at this stage. I don't think it makes sense for every single county and city in the, in the United States to undertake a location-based mapping exercise on their own. One, because our colleagues at FCC are already doing that and it's a mammoth undertaking. Uh, and two, because you, you don't know yet what you're engaging with. I think you should be, you should await the FCC maps and then support your state office in its challenges to the FCC maps. And then secondarily, you should await the state challenge process uh, post that uh, FCC challenge process so that you can make sure that everybody in your community gets online. That is a core hurdle though. I can tell you, our team members out in the states and territories are going to reach out to every single tribal government and local government. And we're gonna to say to them, here's the plan guys. Is this gonna serve everybody in your community? Now, that doesn't mean that every local leader has a veto over the state plan. What, what it means is they will raise issues for us and then we're gonna to get to the bottom of it. And there may be situations where the thing that make, you know, this kind of equities that had to be balanced at the state level versus at the local level meant that you might get a technology that wasn't your community's first choice you might get a, 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 you know, you may not have a level of competition that you want in your community. You know, we, th this is not a, this is not broadband utopia, but this is universal broadband. So we're going to get it to everybody. We're going to figure out how to do that within the, the confines of the, the program we've got, the legal structure we've got, and the amount of funds we've got. All right. Um, well, we're just about at time. I'm going to, I'm going to squeeze in one last question before we close, which is um, if you could speak to the rules and under B for uh, middle mile. Sure. Well, first, I want to direct everybody's attention to the Middle Mile program, uh, which has deadlines that are fast approaching, uh, has its own NOFO. Uh, it is uh, a really uh, awesome program uh, that's out there that you can you could get building Middle Mile under our Middle Mile program way before you'd ever get any Middle Mile built under beat. So like if Middle Mile is top of your mind, read that NOFO, get on that web. I don't know if we've published that the Middle Mile. We've done at least one Middle Mile webinar. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, go watch that one. Uh, finish this one first, but then go watch that one. 
Uh, and, uh, but then yes, middle mile can be a component uh, of, a, of a, a bead project. It just can't be the only thing there. So we're not gonna underbead, build middle mile on a sort of like, if they build it, then they'll come type approach. You've got to build middle mile with, you know, already a la at least a last mile user that will utilize that network to get the rest of the folks online. You can't just be building open access uh, middle mile networks, which is a laudable thing to do, but, you know, that's not the, the purpose of this program. Um, and to your point, um, right, there's a middle mile uh, program ex that is dedicated for that. And Scott and Darren, I really appreciate you getting on it. You know, people are just getting to know the NOFO. And so really asking a lot of the policy questions and programmatic questions embedded in that. So I hope that this helps you get to know this program a little bit better as we work with you as the official grants office, which, you know, serves as the fiduciary um, uh, uh, on these programs. So thank you very much for joining us and being available. I think there will be many more questions for you um, once we get to uh, the state starting to spend some of this money. Um, and with that, I don't know if we had a slide or any information about, there's another webinar in this series um, tomorrow on the Digital Equity Act. Um, and so I hope that you guys will go to, for now, the Broadband USA website to sign up for that webinar tomorrow and continue to ask these good questions, which we will drive into our FAQ process um, and try to uh, get those answered for you that way. But thank you so much for your participation, and um, we look forward to working with you. Thanks. <laughs>